Hello friends, welcome back. Myself Pushpendra Singh, and uh, we are going to start with our daily current affairs. So today you have 12, 22nd July 2021, and uh, these lectures, as you know, are basically useful for those who are preparing for the civil services examination, which is conducted by the UPSC. All right. So you can supplement your preparation with the help of these lectures. So first news is all about the man portable. Anti tank guided missile, which is in the short form, we also say that the MPA TZM, which is a man portable, that means the man can basically you know hold a tripod, which is being specifically used for the purpose of the launching of the anti tank guided missile. So, very simple, there is a you know a tripod which is basically you know handled by the person or by the man. And there you will have this launcher and this launcher is basically you know used to hold by this person who is basically standing nearby okay and then the, the rocket will be launched okay here the rocket will be ultimately launched with the help of this launcher so this type of mechanism is there okay so your defense research and development organization DRDO on 21st of July 2021 have successfully test fired a uh, indigenously developed low weight fire and forget the man portable anti-tank guided missile right so it is a low weight because the person or the or the armed personnel basically can carry can easily hold can easily you know manage to hold this portable anti-tank guided missile system so all mission objectives are basically met as per the statement which have been provided by the ministry of defense so this missile right being seen as one which will give a major push to the art nirbhar bharat also right as well as it will also strengthen the indian armed forces also with that respect okay so here all missions objectives were basically met right and this missile that we are talking about have already been successfully flight tested for the maximum range right so here the defense research and the development agency has said in the statement that you know uh, that this missile have incorporated you know the state of art the miniature the infrared imaging seeker okay and along with that it has also got the advanced avionics which will basically help or which will basically responsible for the precision targeting right specifically the targets so this missile was specifically launched for the main portable launcher that was basically uh, using a tripod okay that is designed for a maximum range of around 2.5 kilometers so as i told you that right you know that's already been successfully test fired for the maximum range so here the maximum range for that is around 2.5 kilometers with a launch weight of around 15 kg 15 kg okay and this missile was launched with the help of this launcher which is integrated with a thermal site and the target was basically mimicking the tank right so instead of tank the target was basically looks like as if it is tank the missile basically hits the target right with the direct mode and the destroy the target with the precision so this has validated the minimum range also successfully so now this man portable anti tank guided missile system have now been tested successfully for the maximum range as well as for the minimum range for both it has been successfully tested by the ministry of defense or by the armed forces specifically with respect to right uh, this type of anti-tank guided missile okay so let's move to the new news so here you can see the armed force personnel who is holding this tripod right and there it is almost like the portable where the you know this rocket launcher right is launching a missile which is basically also called the anti-tank guided missile okay next the first bird flu death in india so here on 21st july 2021 right an 11 year old boy have died because of the h5n1 avian influenza or the word flu in delhi so with the death of this 11 year boy right the india has confirmed the first death of word flu right in the country so here it is due to the word flu the first recorded death is because of this word flu in this year okay and uh, 
as you know that in january the word flu was confirmed in the several states with thousands of the words including the migratory species being found dead right and since then there was possibility that this word flu may be there in our country so what is the word flu why we are concerning about it so word flu is also known as h5n1 avian influenza okay which is a disease which is caused by the avian influenza type a virus right which is basically typically found in the wild birds so these wild birds are basically reservoir to these h5n1 avian influenza which is basically causing the influenza type of situations in the birds as well as in the humans also right and the virus can infect you know the domestic poultry and from that the the persons get also get infected right apart from the poultry right for example you know that the chickens ducks turkey right they can be infected because of H h5n1 you know in avian influenza virus right and there was also reports that this h5n1 that we are talking about this avian influenza also affected the pigs apart from uh, these poultries right it has also affected pigs cats right even the tigers also it has been reported specifically from the thailand 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 reported that the tiger got right the positive symptoms or the positive confirmed case of the word flu right here the avian influenza type virus that we are talking is specifically okay influenza type a virus right that has been specifically classified based on the two proteins that we are basically concerning about the first is the hemagglutinin right which is also known as ha the second is the neuromedine base right that is the neuraminidase which is also known as na right there are about 8 you know uh, you know this there are about 18 ha types of subtypes so that is you know uh, that first protein that we are talking about that hemagglutinin right so that is the first protein that is basically used for demarcating or you know demarcating the subtypes of this virus so there are almost 18 types of you know this you know ha uh, you know subtypes and several combination of these two proteins are also possible for example now you have this h5n1 right you can have also h7n2 you can have also h9n6 you can have also for example h17 and 10 right so lot of combinations are there because of these proteins and there are also reports of the avian and the spine you know swine influenza infections in the humans for example in the human related uh, the avian or the word flu related cases in the humans that are known as specifically h1n1 right h1n2 h5n1 that is the current one right and h7n9 these are basically the, those influenzas which are basically affecting the humans or the human population all right so let's begin to the new news the sc verdict on the cooperative society so here the very important aspect is that you know related to the supreme court verdict related to you know uh, basically your the 97th constitutional amendment act so here the supreme court basically held right certain important uh, uh, you know the verdict with respect to the 97th constitutional amendment act so i'll come to that a briefly basics basics so supreme court basically struck down right a parts of the 97th constitutional amendment act so a parts of the 97th constitutional amendment act was basically struck down by the honorable supreme court okay now now what is this 97th constitutional amendment act as you know that the 97th constitutional amendment act this is basically related to the cooperative societies the cooperative societies right which is a basically become a part of the fundamental rights under article 19 clause 1 clause c so the 97th constitutional amendment act basically related to right the formation of this corporate societies which have become your fundamental rights under article 19 1 clause c right uh, by this 97th constitutional amendment act which was passed in 2011 right this act basically introduced the part 9 b to the constitution so part 9 b was basically introduced which is basically related to right uh, the cooperative societies and which has let down the several stipulations right for the state legislations governing 
uh, the cooperative societies. So, Supreme Court basically struck down a certain portions of this 97 Constitutional Amendment Act, which is basically which is basically sought to crimp or to shrink down or to control the powers of the state government over the cooperative societies. What the government have basically argued here is specifically the National Cooperative Union of uh, Union of India basically express the unhappiness over the judgments. What the government argued in that case, the government says that they were basically injecting or the government tried to inject, inject the professionalism as well as the autonomy into the functioning of these societies. So there are lack of autonomies by the members which has ultimately led to the poor services and the low productivity in this cooperative society. So even the elections are not held on the time. So these cooperative societies need to run on the well established democratic principles. What was the court judgment? Right? The cooperative societies, you know, uh, the Supreme Court basically held that these cooperative societies, you know, uh, comes under the exclusive legislative power of or exclusive legislative power of the state legislature. So here the what the part 9th V that we are talking consisting of certain articles. For example, article 243 ZH to article 243 ZT. These are the articles. Right, which governs the cooperative societies has significantly and substantially impacted the state legislatures. Right, exclusive legislative power over the corporate sector under the entry 32 of the state list. So that amendment that was passed by you know uh, uh, by 97th Const Constitutional Amendment Act that was basically without ratification from the state. So the Supreme Court held that ratification from the state was basically uh, was utmost importance. And here it has significantly impacted the state legislature's exclusive legislative power. So as you know that when uh, when you have this GST bill was basically passed or at least half of the state legislature was basically, you know, uh, they have uh, they have basically, uh, you know, acceded to that constitutional amendment or they have ratified that constitutional amendment. But no such ratification in respect to the 97th Constitutional Amendment Act was made. And the Supreme Court basically held that this amendment act basically significantly impacted the scope of uh, right, that the legislative power which have been given to the to the basically, you know, uh, specifically to the state governments in that respect. The right. Supreme Court also wanted the formulation of the nation policy on the cooperatives. Right. And with respect to the multi -late, multi state cooperative uh, cooperative societies here with respect to that. Okay, uh, uh, the Supreme Court also did not strike down the portion of the part 9V uh, of the amending concerning about multi-state cooperative societies due to the lack of ratification. Right here, you know, when it comes to these multi-state cooperative societies, right, uh, the legislative power would be would that of the Union of India that is contained in the list 14 of, you know, of, of the of the Union list. So that is. The part 9B of the constitution is operative only so far it concerned with the multi-state cooperative societies. So only with respect to the multi-state cooperative societies, right, the Supreme Court have not stuck down, right, the provisions of the, the provisions of this 97th Constitutional Amendment Act. Okay, so this is the most important aspect with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, the striking down of certain portions related to the 97th Constitutional Amendment Act. Okay. Now, the another important aspect is that the Supreme Court basically also want the national policy on the cooperatives, right, which will ensure, you know, uh, that there is uniformity in the cooperative acts across the states, right, so that there is a transparency in them, which will ultimately strengthen the cooperative movement in our country. So here, you know, uh, uh, you know, those according to certain experts, you know, the verdict is basically related to the mandatory registration of the cooperatives, minimum qualification of the board members, tenure, their time frame, etc. Et right? The Supreme Court specifically in the judgment, right, uphold, right, the Gujarat High Court verdict. The Gujarat High Court verdict was also related to, uh, right, uh, you know, the applications of this multi-state cooperative societies. So specifically, the Supreme Court in the landmark verdict, which have uh, which have basically uh, you know given on the 20th July, specifically uphold the 2013 Gujarat High Court verdict, right? Which is basically also have struck down certain portions of the 97th Constitutional Amendment Act. So this Supreme Court landmark verdict is also 
offending the Gujarat High Court, yeah, the verdict which is also striking down certain portions of this 97 Constitution Amendment Act. All right. So let's begin to the new news. The Delta variant to dominate, which has been held by WHO or World Health Organization. So highly contagious, which is spreading very fast in in the in the world. Right, the Delta variant of the COVID-19 expected to spread very fast and expected to be the dominant strain of the virus over the next few months, as it has been held by the uh, by the World Health Organization, specifically on the you know with respect to the Delta variant. So Delta variant, which have been first detected in India, now it has been reported in almost 124 territories. Right, you know. So here, 13 more than last week, and here already accounts for more than three quarters of the the sequence specimen in many major countries with respect to these delta variants okay so now there are three you know the coronavirus variants of the concerns that are basically found in the world the first is basically alpha right first is basically alpha that was first de detected in britain that was first detected in britain and now it has been reported in almost 180 countries the second that we are talking about the beta right the beta was first detected in south africa now it has been found in almost 130 territories or 130 countries third is basically your gamma the gamma variant or the gamma variants of the concern the gamma variant was basically first detected in brazil now it has been found in the 78 right in the territories so there are three coronavirus variants of the concern alpha beta and gamma the alpha is detected in the britain the beta has detected in africa the gamma was detected in the brazil right so according to the sars cov 2 sequences which was done and which was submitted right you know this prevalence of this uh, you know uh, of this uh, the basically your beta delta variants will exceed around 75% in the several countries and those countries which are included where this contagious virus is spreading very fast are australia bangladesh botswana britain china denmark india also included indonesia israel portugal russia singapore and south africa these are the countries where this delta variant can grow very fast so growing evidence support that this increasing of this transmissibility of this delta variant right as compared to right uh, the non variants of the concern that we are talking specifically okay so here you know uh, however the exact mechanism for increasing of the transmissibility remains unclear why this delta variant is spreading or why this delta variant is so much contagious the organization or the who is also confirmed that this global increase in the transmission in the, in the transmission which is uh, which is driven by important factors or which are driven by the four important factors right the first is more transmissible variant which is a delta variant the second is the relaxation in the relaxation in the public health measures the third is increase in the social mixing right which is also responsible and the fourth is the large number of unvaccinated unvaccinated people so there are four regions or there are four factors why this contagious delta variant is spreading the first is obviously the transmissibility of the virus or you know the capacity of the virus to to spread or to transmit relaxation of this health related measures social mixing after lockdown as well as unvaccinated people they are susceptibility in the people right uh, you know against this vaccine right they may have they may have some ill effect the people can you know are thinking in various way but definitely there are no uh, complications and people should come forward for these vaccines right and uh, the cases were up to you know 30 percent specifically in the western pacific region right and the cases basically went up to around 21 percent in the european re region because of this delta variant right and the highest number of new cases that was reported from the indonesia from the britain from the brazil specifically from this delta variant so it is of the greater concern not only for for these countries but also for india also okay next the new shepherd and the space tourism so here as you have as you have seen the news that you know jeff bezos who is also the chairperson of uh, the amazon right uh, has made a short journey to up to the karman height or up to the karman line which is basically a distance from the earth surface that is around 100 kilometers to the space right and it was the first crewed flight right on his rocket 
the rocket is named as the new shepard right so it is the name of that rocket which is known as the new shepard so new new shepard is nothing but a rocket system right new new shepard is nothing but a rocket system which have been designed right to take these astronauts right as well as the research personnel right or the payloads to the kerman line or beyond the kerman line right and it has been decided by the jeff bezos long back to introduce the space tourism or you know to introduce uh, right uh, the floating colonies specifically in the space right and it has been internationally recognized boundary of the space that is the kerman line that has been 100 kilometers from the surface of earth so this idea is to provide the easier and most effective or the most cost effective access to the space right specifically for the purpose of academic research for corporate technology development for entrepreneurship right for 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 the tourism and etc so this uh, this new shepard will provide or will allow the space tourist to experience the micro gravity right uh, when this spacecraft like the new shepard will take them to the height of around 100 kilometers above the earth so definitely uh, you know uh, the new shepard which is which was the aircraft that was basically taken or the rocket system which was taken the jeff bezos as well as the crew members that has been named after the astronaut the alan shepard that was the first american that go to the space so alan jeffon alan shepard was basically the first american that has gone that has gone to the space so how the, how does it how does it work so it is a 6 person crew capsule right you can see here right and it's a very very important right here it is a single stage suborb suborbital rocket rocket right and uh, you can easily see the parachutes where the similar to the russia's the soyuz landing right uh, this blue shepard you know is also slowly right uh, uh, slowly you know descend with the help of this parachutes and ultimately cushioned by you know some sort of a soft soft landing jacks which were basically used specifically for the landing of these peoples from the space okay so here the most important aspect is that this basically consisting of you know uh, you know the two parts specifically the cabin capsule as well as the rocket or the booster next the space tourism so first of all first of all let us understand about the space tourism okay so the space tourism is basically now been uh, now been basically you know promoted with the help of the jeff bezos but there are a lot of concerns so there are a lot of pros and the cons with respect to the space tourism now let us understand first the cons what are the cons related to the space tourism so first of all the first and foremost is the exposure that has been given to the uh, to the basically you know uh, to the astronauts or the people who will ultimately go to the kerman line to the sun's radiation right so special space travel technology at that nascent stage can make you know a dangerous venture right the space travelers can likely to get experience to the harmful radiations from the sun right to that height and as well as there are certain health related aspects also right so spending long hours in the zero gravity or the micro gravity condition can basically dangerous for the persons specifically the persons which are uh, which are basically you know affected because of cardiovascular diseases uh, right as well as you know certain other you know uh, the mucoskeleton system if the people accidentally get exposed to high energy ionic cosmic rays it may lead to ultimately cancer to their people and that is also exposed that is also exposure right to the harmful organism right specifically we may uh, you know uh, introduce some harmful microorganism from the space into the atmosphere of the earth with the help of these uh, these rockets and definitely there are poor regulations lack of proper regulations and adequate safety protocols can make the space travel extremely dangerous also for the people right and there is also issue related to the commercialization the companies engaged in this form can can basically uh, may fail to stick to the safety measures right specifically to get more customers for the basically commercialization and definitely there is also issue related to the wastage of the resources right so experimentation unsuccessful ventures may cause unnecessary wastage of the resources right which may be used specifically for the development purpose right and definitely it is not not environmental friendly also several natural resources were basically wasted in you know in flying the you know fuel guzzling rockets uh, it also you know pollutes uh, the atmosphere and ultimately uh, the space program is bad for our environment you can say that okay 
and definitely it can also produce lot of the greenhouse gases or lot of uh, the gases which may not be good for our atmosphere okay now let us understand the pros for the space tourism so first of all it may boost the economy so yes yeah, space tourism will ultimately increase the commercial activity specifically uh, when you have this poor uh, state of the world economy and definitely it will also also boost the employment right so space tourism will ultimately give the boost to the employment to the thousands of the people the manufacturing of this new and better space spacecraft will give employment to the lakhs of the people many skilled people will get ultimately the opportunity to get employment and definitely it will also draw the investors from around the world so it is basically renewed the interest in the space exploration that will draw the investors right uh, for more financial you know inputs to support more innovations in the industry as well as it will pave for the new resources right to help find out some sort of a minerals and other precious materials in the space as well as other other planets so that will help the people of the earth with natural resources right which are already depleting site and right? as well as the adventurous tourism now that will open the new avenue for this adventurous peoples for adventurous tourism right so that is what is something that is we uh, require next the thermoelectric power generation so the researchers have developed right uh, you know uh, the researchers have developed a new low, low cost uh, specifically the electric contact material for the thermoelectric devices that are stable at the high temperature so researchers from the international advanced research center for the powder metallurgy and the new materials which is been an autonomous institute with the department of the science and technology have designed and developed that this thermoelectric modules that ultimately used right you know the telluride and the magnesium stearide silicide compounds specifically for the power generation right so here uh, here the thermoelectric materials ultimately convert the thermal energy okay that Uh, basically comes out from the sun and that is basically directly converting into the electricity through process that involve the solid state electron and photon diffusion process that you would have studied in your uh, in your physics so through that principle that we know about uh, about you know uh, that it has almost you know uh, needed the thermoelectric materials energy con conservation right so with that uses of this advanced materials the thermal or the thermal energy conversion will be very high efficiently and this nanotechnology basically brought the innovations to improve this efficiency of these materials right uh, specifically that will have lot of applications right and uh, that will make electricity you know uh, much more cheaper right uh, but there are lot of issues like the initially the electricity produced may be costlier than other technologies okay now let us understand there are lot of advantages also what are the advantage of this uh, thermoelectric generators first of all you can get the reliable source of energy so reliability is the most important you know uh, the advantage second it is also the environmental friendly because you are ultimately converting the thermal energy into electricity then it is also having the high scalability high scalability that is which means uh, uh, that that can be applied to the heat heat sources of any size okay then other important advantage is that it is having the lower production cost lower production cost and other advantage may be right uh, you know the recyclable the recycle waste right that is your heat energy right and the, but there are lot of limitations also with that thermoelectric generators what are the limitations right it is basically having the low energy conversion you know uh, efficiency rate right another important limitations is is basically require the relatively constant heat source right so heat source constant heat source is basically required the another important limitation may be the lack of education the lack of expertise the lack of industry education about the, the lack of you know curriculum based education or about the thermoelectric generators may be the another limitations right the another limitation may be the slow technological technological progression right as well as the high output resistance specifically with respect to the thermoelectric generators as well as you will have some sort of adverse thermal characteristics also right so these are some of the uh, some of those limitations with respect to the thermoelectric generators with that now let us understand some of this applications so first of all the thermoelectric generators so it can be used to power the lights once this electricity is generated 
or the electricity is basically generated with the help of this heat system. You can use that electricity to power the lights, fans, several instruments like alarm systems, greenhouses, right, the radio receivers, the TV sets and etc. The heat source of this thermoelectric generator that we are talking serve as an important radioactive element for many space probes including you know uh, the mass curiosity rover that basically used the solar cells which basically we employ right only the high frequency part of the radiation right and the low frequency heat energy is ultimately wasted with the help of this thermo thermoelectrical generators right which has been uh, the thermoelectric devices which have been integrated with this solar system that can convert it the wasted heat energy or the low frequency heat energy uh, into the useful energy and that is basically again can be used or can be utilizable so that waste heat which has been produced from the cars from the automobiles from the microphones from industrial processes can be harvested with the help of this thermo thermal electrical generators right and thereby increasing the efficiency of the ultimately system and that we can reduce or minimize the waste which has been you know happens because of this uh, because of uh, in the absence of this thermoelectrical generators okay next the national gallery of the modern art so here the union culture minister have recently been informed that the national gallery of the modern art would be renovated would be refabricated right would be reorganized as a part of the commemoration of the 75th independence day that is going to be celebrated in the next year that is in 2022 right so this national gallery of the modern art which is a premier art gallery right ultimate aim of this national gallery of the modern art is to acquire and to preserve the works related to the modern art right and it is specifically uh, have the gallery or the works specifically from 1850s onward right and uh, the national gallery of the modern art is basically run and administered as a subordinate office to the ministry of culture government of india okay now this national gallery of the modern art basically consists of lot of collections it include the works which are done by the eminent artists like the Thomas Daniel, the Raja Ravi Verma, the Anandra, right, the Avinandra Tagore, Ravindranath Tagore, right, the Gajanandra Tagore, Nandalal Bose, Jamuni Roy, the Amrita Shergil, as well as the few foreign artists. So the work are, are currently being preserved. And the main museum of this, uh, you know, of this national gallery of the modern art is located or established in 18, in 1954 okay by the government of india in new delhi okay apart from this main muse main museum their subsequent branches have been opened at the mumbai and the bangalore for the better preservation better collection right of these works at the different places also all right next the new generation akash missile so recently the defense research and development organization drdo have successfully test fired right the new generation akas missile right which is a basically the surface to air missile from the integrated test range of the coast of orissa okay so this new generation akas missile system which has been developed by drdo laboratory which is located in the hyderabad with the collaboration of other drdo laboratory right this new or advanced version of this akas missile will definitely strike the targets at a distance of around 60 kilometers that will add the new feat or the new capability in the feet of the Indian, uh, you know, air forces that the new version of the Akash missile can fly up to the speed of the Mach 2.5, right? And that would ultimately prove to be the to be the force multiplier for this air defense capability of the Indian air force, right? Here you can see that the new advanced version of the Akash missile is being launched. Historic urban landscape project. So here, Madhya Pradesh, Gwalior, and Ocha cities, right? In the Madhya Pradesh, Gwalior and the Ocha cities have been selected by the UNESCO's under urban, you know, heritage urban landscape project, right, which have been implemented by the UNESCO in various countries, right, in the world, right, that was started in 2011. The main purpose of this historic urban landscape project is to have the well-planned development, inclusive development of certain fast-growing historical cities, right. You know definitely that will also preserve the culture and the heritage specifically to those historical cities so ultimate aim of this historic urban historic urban landscape project is to preserve is to safeguard uh, is to basically inclusive development well-planned developmental activities specifically in those historic cities so here yeah, the chief minister of madhya pradesh sivra singh chohan have virtually launched the unesco's historic urban landscape project specifically for the Gwalior as well as the Ocha cities 
as these both of both of the cities have been uh, have been selected for have been selected by the unesco under the historic urban landscape project and the chief minister shivraj singh rawat shivraj singh chauhan have virtually launched this landscape project through the video conferencing in gwalior and ocha six cities from the south asia have already been included right uh, it also include the ajmer and the baranasi from the india the ajmer from rajasthan the Bar baranasi from up that have been already been involved and with the inclusion of this gwalior and the ocha the india will get two more additional cities so ocha and the gwalior was gwalior would be the seventh and the eighth cities from the south asia right and these cities will be jointly developed by the unesco government of india as well as the government of madhya pradesh and that will mainly focus on the historic and the cultural improvement of those cities by have the sustainable well planned and the, you know uh, the historic development of those cities and that will also promote the tourism specifically in the madhya pradesh that will that will give the boost uh, that will give the new dimension and as well as that will also boost the employment opportunities right that will also be created specifically you know in the sector of the tourism next liverpool liverpool is basically a city right in the united kingdom recently the liverpool have been stripped of the world heritage status right after a un committee which have been met in the china have found that the development activities which have been initiated by the liverpool have threatened the value of the city's waterfront which is been known for the world heritage site right so uh, so this un committee have decided to strip off the world heritage status to that the liverpool so decision was made by a secret ballot by the UN, by the unesco committee or the un committee which which was met in the china right and it has already previously warned to the liverpool that any sort of a developmental activities that has threatened the waterfront right and uh, any sort of a developmental activities like new everton you know fc stadium that is basically impacting the serious deterioration to that historic site of the waterfront but the liverpool did not stop here and the city was basically awarded or city was basically included in the unesco's world heritage site it was given the title in 2004 right with other uh, you know recognized cities of the historic importance like the taj mahal egypt pyramid as well as the canterbury cathedral right now uh, now the liverpool will be stripped of its world heritage status all right next the kaman aman setu as you know that yesterday the eid ul zuha was basically celebrated throughout the world on the occasion of this eid ul zuha right a friendship gesture or the gesture of the tranquility and the friendship was basically shown by the indian armed forces right specifically at the kaman aman setu right which is basically you know in the uri district of you know uh, specifically in the in the in the india and pakistan border so in the in the gesture of the friendship and the tranquility right on that occasion of the idul ul zuha right you know the indian pakistan army have have basically held a flag meeting and exchange the sweets at the kaman aman setu right at the uri and as well as at the titwal crossing in the kishan ganga river in the north kashmir kupwara district so it is a one of the important step for uh, for increasing the friendship tranquility and the coordination and cooperation among the indian and pakistani armed forces so this kaman aman setu is located in the uri district in the northern kashmir right the kaman aman setu is a friendship bridge between india and the pakistan is is another you know the milestone for the indian pakistan relationship and it is the last point on the india pakistan border in the uri district also right so here you have this kaman aman setu so that's all for today thank you very much we'll meet again tomorrow for our next current affairs Thank you.